terms, which uh, Professor uh, Brymar feels might be desirable from a sociological and philosophical basis. He's, I'm sure he's not saying it would be desirable from an American economical basis, but for other reasons, he may be, in his opinion, he, uh, he believes that. I, I personally do not, okay? Now, if there was a $500,000, a 100% tax over a $500,000 estate, which is very close to what they have in England, uh, there, the insurance that a wealthy, far-seeing uh, farm owner could carry, let's say $2 million worth of insurance to pay the estate tax if he died, uh, that's very, very expensive, you understand. Uh, not very many people can afford any $2 million of life insurance. That, that's a big item. Second, the $2 million itself is part of the estate. It doesn't uh, go into the estate tax-free. That's part of your estate. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's a tax of that sort, if that is what is desired by the government and the people who elect the government, uh, that would be extremely effective in breaking up any uh, usable tract of land. And if a man had three sons and they were all going to inherit uh, 500 acres of Iowa land, uh, there is no way he could pass 1,500 acres of good Iowa land down to his three sons uh, if there was a 100% inheritance tax over half a million. Just for the record, I did not suggest the 500,000. I never used the word punitive. I wouldn't because that's a loaded term and I don't use that kind of term. All I said was, if you want to preserve family farm agriculture, and this is an if, then you do have to have a graduated inheritance tax, which indeed we have had for 60 years. Now just where, you know, where, where it graduates during, where it flexes is a matter of decision. But it is not a, a sharp cutoff. A, grad, you know, a graduated one is not a, a, is not a cutoff one. In fact, I, if I relieve any general idea, again, if you want it, if this is generally the goal, then various kinds of taxes as well as subsidies. I, th I would always argue for the graduation principle. I'm one, this may surprise you, I'm not in favor of the absolutely sharp cut off in size or direct, benefic direct uh, payments to farmers. I would graduate it. I would say after the family size farm, the, the, you begin to factor down the deficiency direct payment under your farm programs. If you want your farm programs as the preamble sales to favor the family farm. You have the highest rate for the family farmer, a little bit lower for the next size, a little bit lower for the next size, but you don't have a sharp cutoff. So I just want to be sure that, not to be misunderstood, I did not talk. You were simply quoting one proposal of a, of a candidate for president, but otherwise neither of us has really said that that would be a practical thing to do. Can we see if there's someone else first? Any other questions? We'll go ahead. Isn't the, on the tax system way it's graduated on the individual basis, as the more you make, the more you pay taxes, isn't the way that the American government sets it up why the family farm is turning to a corporate like subchapter S, because you only pay like up to a certain percentage instead of being graduated all the way up like for 75% bracket, and like in corporate subchapter S, maybe only 50 or 60%. You're actually saying more isn't the way the tax law set up turning the American farm to a corporate farm to save money on taxes? I'll leave that to, to general, although I want to make it real clear, when I talked about the industrial corporation farm, I didn't mean the family farm, the chap subchapter S farm. I was talking about the tenecos and so on. Uh, yes, of course, the, the corporation tax is less graduated than the individual, but then, of course, the individuals who are receiving money from the corporation subject to the graduation of their own income. But this is more your field. Uh, the, um, I, I'm n neither, uh, when we, uh, whether it's uh, one family that incorporated uh, to save uh, taxes, uh, uh, that is not what we meant by a corporate farm versus an uh, uh, individual family farm. I mean, in other words, a family that owned all the stock of a corporation that owned a small farm by any definition would be a family farm. Uh, the, um, there is a savings to be made in answer to your question uh, by incorporating, 
But much more important than that, and I can't uh, tell you how strongly I advise everybody that's involved in this to do it, is if you're a member of a large family and you've got a father or a grandfather that uh, owns a lot of agricultural property, uh, for God's sakes, uh, try to get him to incorporate so that if he does die, uh, at least the heirs uh, can uh, have some kind of manner of legally voting so that a majority of the stockholders, being all the members of the family, if that's who they are, by a numerical vote can make a decision, or they can elect one guy in the family who can make a decision, rather than end up in the courts with everybody battling and half the income from the farm going to pay legal fees. Yes, please. <coughs> Gentlemen, in addressing the, the concept that preserving family farms and kids preserves a social and political structure of America, I mean, assume you mean rural society as we're acquainted with it. Uh, rural society is, is more than just the farms, as you alluded to. It's the, it's the small towns and the businesses connected with that. Now, whereas so many people, particularly in an agricultural institution like this, address themselves in terms of family farm and the young farmer being started in agriculture and agriculture being controlled, no one seems to be too concerned about what's happening on the main street of these towns, where in my mind I see more and more company stores, chain stores uh, coming in rural areas, rural towns. No one's concerned with the Everyone's concerned whether the son of a farmer can start a farm himself. And no one's concerned whether the son of a store owner can go out and start his own store as his father did or his grandfather did. It seems to me it's quite difficult for someone to go out and say, I want to be a grocery store <coughs> owner and manager, and get to its start more difficult than it is for a young man who wants to get into farming. I'm not acquainted that the government has similar programs to help that person out to the same extent that FHA does. Unless you preserve this also, aren't you going to have problems in preserving the social and political structure that you really want to maintain? Well, first answer up the question was what about who's going to own and control businesses? Of course, the first answer is that wasn't our t subject, and so we weren't addressing it. We weren't asked to. So all I would say is that, to some extent, to some extent, this is just one facet of a of a bigger question. I'm teaching a young undergraduate course in policies. And we start with greening of America, and <coughs> Hazel Henderson, and the thesis you've heard so often that. We're just caught up in an enormous bureaucracy where the individual is lost and so on and so forth. Alienation is the word they use. I think to some extent, one reason that you, in fact I know this, Whitney Griswold, the historian, said it some 30 or 40 years ago. One reason the urban public at, at large has a, what shall I say, a sympathetic and empathetic interest in the family farm because they see this as the last area where you still have private entrepreneurship as the prevailing form. They said they don't want it. They, they've lost it every place else. They don't want to lose it here. So I would say your question is, is, is a genuine question. It's a different question for a different session. But I think that the parallel there is, is, I think, rather interesting, that to some extent one reason this question does come up about family farm is at least here is one area where you still do have private entrepreneurship. Do you want to save it for this one last area? We have time for a couple more questions if anyone has any. Well, I'm going to step away from form a little bit and then ask a question myself. Uh, last night, Professor Gurley was addressing himself to uh, the future of American economy, and he laid out a rather um, pessimistic future for capitalism. And I'd just like to ask our participants how they view um, agricultural uh, business in, uh, 
in the framework of capitalism versus socialism? Is it our last, is it the last bulwark of capitalism? Um, or is socialism, as Dr. Gurley uh, said last night, inevitable? Uh, I, I think, particularly looking at a, a, a group, uh, the majority of the st uh, people here are students uh, starting out, I really don't think that there has been a time in the history of our country in the last hundred years uh, where there is more opportunity uh, for a young man with brains and energy and the ability to work hard, and I'm, that doesn't mean just a young man or a young woman, than there is right today. Uh, that uh, in our case, we are, uh, for investors, the first thing any of our people try to find is somebody that can run it, that somebody that is capable, uh, th uh, that is willing to work hard. Uh, these, uh, th this is getting to be a rare phenomenon in the United States today, and the uh, guy or the lady that uh, is willing to do it has almost a vacuum that she can move, he or she can move into. Uh, the, uh, if you're willing to do it, uh, you'll, uh, I don't think that uh, there, everybody is trying to line up with you. Uh, you can get all the capital you want. Uh, if you're capable and have the drive and energy like our fathers and grandfathers had, uh, there is no limit to uh, what can be done today, and I don't think that uh, ever in the history of the United States uh, is there more opportunity than there is right now, and this is under our present capitalistic system. How do you look at it? How do you characterize it? Some major changes are taking place. We have changed the structure into what is dominated by large groups. It really is. Good, for good or bad, it really is. The resource base is, is going through an alteration. We were a pioneer, you've heard this so often, but it's worth hearing again. We were a pioneer nation until about two generations ago when we thought of ourselves as unlimited physical resources. Now we know we don't, we are an occupied country now. We know that certain other resources are being, becoming scarcer. Can we make the adjustment? Is, is this going to change the economy? Who's going to own and control? Who's going to provide the capital? And I think that to talk in terms of whether we're going to have capitalism or socialism is, an, is, is not a service. I think it's a disservice. The question is, what, how do you marshal our combined intellects? I hope our moral standards, our sense of fairness and justice so that you can deal with these things. Uh, you dare convert the remaining holders of the fossil fuel energies in, into big monopolies for monopoly pricing, which is a very real possibility. I, I hope you get into that. How do, how do you deal with an, with an economy where at one time you had plentiful energy resources, now they aren't plentiful, and, and, and with OPEC creating an, an oligopoly shelter for it. These are, and you don't, you don't, so, you don't solve the, I tell my, I tell my students, and I know Dr. I, General Oppenheimer agree with me, you don't solve it by throwing on epigrams. You see, and they address it, and what are the pros and cons, and I'm real glad that you're all, I'm kind of glad you're giving us this chance, because I want to repeat my respect, the fact that you all come out in a snowy night and begin to think about some of these things, and I think the issues, if I'm not as optimistic as General Oppenheimer, I'm not terrible pessimistic either. I like to use the words from South Pacific. I'm just not a cockeyed optimist. Thanks very much. Well, if there's no further questions, thank you for coming. And can we give a warm response?